Okay, so it is the official start time. Uh, this time is 7 p.m. Central European time. It is, I believe, 1 p.m. Um, Eastern time in the United States. I think it's also uh, 7 p.m. Cairo time. Um, I think there's a there's kind of the, those times don't always match up uh, throughout the year. I think they change with uh, different daylight savings times. But as of right now, I think it's it's right now 7 p.m. in Cairo. Um, and 1 p.m. on the East Coast, and it should be 10 p.m. on the West Coast. I think I did the math wrong. Somebody left a comment on the syllabus saying that it's actually 10 p.m. So whatever time it is where you are, this will be the usual start time of the course. Um, and I have a couple things I wanna say just to get started. Uh, so the first thing is that as you all know, and we'll probably get tired of hearing, uh, this course is, funded through Patreon. So it's a free course, it will always be a free course. And, and the, the primary goal of this course is to make the subject accessible to anyone who would like to study it. So one of my big um, complaints about Egyptology is um, it's, a, it's a subject that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, most people develop an interest in it in childhood, uh, but the only way to go beyond sort of a, a, a basic interest to actually start learning about it is to study at some um, exclusive institution of higher education, uh, normally uh, elite universities, which obviously not everyone has access to. Um, I didn't. So I, 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 um, I wasn't able to study Egyptian formally as an undergrad. I, I studied it sort of on my own and, and with a professor at UT Austin and then um, managed to get into grad school at one of those uh, quote unquote elite institutions that teaches this subject. Um, so I fully recognize the need for, for access to things. And it's not really just Egyptology, it's pretty much anything that you might be interested in, in learning more about to find out whether it's the thing for you. Um, I feel like everybody in the world should have a chance to, to take a look at it and see. Uh, so that's the purpose of this course is to provide a point of entry to people who think they might be interested in this um, so that they can learn more about it and either go on to study it or, um, you know, just have it as, as something interesting that uh, to enjoy and that enriches your life. Uh, so this course itself is specifically designed to be as low pressure as possible. So you're never required to attend. Um, part of the reason for live streaming and putting the videos on YouTube after the fact is so that if you can't attend for whatever reason, but you want to, you can go watch the videos later and keep up. Um, you're always welcome to come and listen without being required to participate in any way. Uh, the way that works, uh, once the course really gets going, there will be uh, a known assignment every week that you'll have the opportunity to prepare in advance, but you can just uh, join the Zoom meeting and just politely decline uh, if the, um, you know, if your turn comes around. Um, you're also welcome to participate without having prepared the homework. Uh, that's something that I always try to encourage uh, you know, without re requiring it, um, anytime the opportunity arises, I always encourage students to go ahead and participate, even if you haven't done the homework, because that exercise where you're kind of trying to figure it out on the fly, um, and, and I'm helping you by telling you the words that you've never seen before, or, you know, giving you hints to help you figure it out, that's actually a really useful exercise for everyone to passively participate in. Um, I've, at least in the, in the online Coptic course, I generally found that having someone agree to participate despite um, not having done the homework gave us an opportunity to sort of slow down and dig into things closely, which is often missed once you start moving quickly with the course. You can, you can gloss over a lot of things. Um, the way I see, the way I learn any subject and especially languages, um, I usually use a metaphor to explain this. Basically, I, the way I see it, there are two language learning strategies at a, at a formal academic level. Uh, there's what I call the fresco strategy, which is the most common one that you'll see in university settings. And that's basically you pick some aspect of the language and you uh, memorize a bunch of tables and, and you learn everything about it and you kind of nail that thing down perfectly. So if we were talking about, you know, uh, nouns and gender, you would learn the different gender and plural morphology of a bunch of different nouns and you would memorize all the, um, you know, declensions if we're talking about Greek and Latin or whatever. 
And then you'll move on to the next aspect of the language and kind of build things up that way. So I call it the fresco method because it's sort of like painting a fresco. You, you put wet plaster on one of the walls, paint in all the details, and then you move to the next section and, and start all over and uh, paint everything in completely so that you do everything piece by piece. And then by the time you're finished, you have the entire mural painted. Uh, the approach that I like to use with language learning is what I call the watercolor method. And the idea there is that you kind of start with a light wash and just kind of cover the whole surface and um, then gradually, you know, you let that part dry and then you add in more precise details. And then at the very end, once most of the picture is there, you go in and put all the ink lines that um, really make everything snap into focus. And I find that um, regardless of which method a instructor chooses, students almost always learn languages through the watercolor method because you can't possibly remember everything, decontextualize one piece at a time. Um, you're going to forget half of those things and you're gonna to have to relearn them again later. So I generally try to lead with that. So um, we'll, we'll move quickly through things. We won't try to learn every single aspect perfectly. And then given the opportunity in later classes, we'll revisit some things that we've seen before, only putting them in the larger context the next time and sort of build a, uh, a more reliable picture that doesn't require a lot of sitting and memorizing things. Uh, which I find is the, the biggest hurdle to students of language, sitting and memorizing things is kind of a drag, um, unless you're just really into it. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that, so as of right now, um, I forget the exact number, somewhere around 320 people have signed up for this course. I don't expect all 320 of you to be here on the very last day of this course, and that's perfectly fine. Um, Again, the purpose of this is to provide a point of access. Quite a few people um, probably saw this and thought, oh, I've always been interested in learning hieroglyphs. And then you come to a few classes and you realize that you weren't actually that interested and you have a lot of other things that you might be interested in. And that's perfectly fine. The goal here is to make sure that this point of access exists. And one of the functions of such a point of access is letting people try things. Um, so if you... Um, you know, if, if you start studying this and, and decide that it's not for you, uh, no apologies necessary, do whatever makes you happy. This is supposed to be um, a source of enjoyment. Okay, so with all that said, does anyone have any questions about those kind of generalities? If you do, um, it's probably a good idea to raise your hand. I think that will push you right to the top of the participants list. So I, I'll, I'll see it. Okay. So I guess I'll just share my screen and, and kind of get started. These are Zoom settings, which is not really the, the first thing. Oh, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the wrong browser window. Okay, there we go. All right, so the first thing that you probably encountered uh, when you got an email about this course was what I call the living syllabus. Um, you have this really nice picture from Nefertari's tomb where she's making offerings to the goddess Isis. There's her name. Um, so that's kind of fun. And, uh, and this tagline, somebody, somebody uh, deleted the vampire part and I rejected their change. Uh, that's, that's an inside joke involving one of the participants whom I believe I saw enter the group. Uh, so there, there, is, there is one vampire, but you, know, you can try to figure out who that is if you're curious. Okay, uh, date, time, and location. This is a time and date link that should give you the time of the course in your local time zone, which hopefully makes things easier. And the Zoom link, which obviously everyone found because there's a bunch of cursors sitting in there. Um, occasionally, I might have to cancel class for whatever reason. So uh, because it's on a Saturday, things sometimes come up. Um, I also have a full-time job, at least until the, the end of August, I'm, I'm still officially employed at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. Uh, which is um, uh, a subcomponent of NYU. Uh, so, you know, sometimes things get busy. Uh, after September 1st, I don't know for sure what I'm going to be doing yet, but I will definitely be employed and quite busy. So there are times when I'll need to cancel class. I will always um, mark those in the calendar and send out messages on Patreon and Discord. And we don't know how long it's going to go, but we'll see. And there's an overview, which you can all read on your own. Um, there's a little bit about me and kind of my bona fides, I guess, if, if you want to see that sort of thing. Um, 
structure suggestion box. I encourage you to use this if you have anything that you want to add. Go ahead and show it to you. So when I open this, I will, I guess I'm not logged in. Oh, I am logged in. Um, so when I open this, I see responses. There are no names attached to those responses. Uh, I will never show them again in this class either. So uh, anything you write in there is only seen by me and I can't see your name. So that's a um, that's an easy way for you to share your feelings anonymously. Why isn't this displaying? There we go. Okay, so that's a good idea. And you can always contact me in any other way if you if you don't feel the need to be anonymous. Um, again, this is supported through Patreon. If it, uh, you should never feel at all obligated to support this project, uh, but if you are able to uh, know that many people are not and by supporting it, you enable me to keep spending time on this and that makes these things available to people who can't afford to support it. So it's kind of a, you know, a communal sort of situation. Uh, the code of content, code of conduct, you can go look at that. It's all very straightforward. Um, no, no hate speech, no intolerant language. Um, you know, the, the things you already know. Don't, don't do mean things. Uh, all the course materials will be in this Google Drive folder, which you should all have access to. Uh, if you go to it, you will also see, you'll probably be able to get a preview of some new things that I'm working on that I haven't put in the syllabus yet. Um, so that's kind of neat. Uh, there's a Reddit thread, there's the Discord. Discord is the primary way that I communicate with people in this course, and it's also the way that you communicate with each other. So very often people will ask questions in the Discord and they ask them at uh, you know, uh, 9 p.m. in California, which is, I don't know, sometime in the wee hours of the morning here, and I don't see it, but someone else does and responds to it. So if you want a fast answer, uh, Discord is a good place to ask questions. Um, if for whatever reason you specifically need an answer from me, uh, go ahead and email me, but you won't get as, an answer quite as quickly. And you won't even get the best answer. Uh, people on Discord are very knowledgeable about this subject. Uh, the YouTube channel, which doesn't have a link to the actual playlist, that will be available once I put this video online. Um, keyboards. So I've had quite a few questions about keyboards. I was just asked one not too long ago. Uh, okay, and there's a question in the chat. Okay, so I'll come back to keyboards in one second. So. So the advanced student tier, this I actually created this in Patreon at um, at a student suggestion. Uh, so I, I was asking, what can I do to create um, patron only content, something that will reward people who support the class in some way that doesn't also take anything away from people who don't or can't. Uh, and that's that's really important to me. I don't I don't want anyone who can't support the course or chooses not to to miss out on anything important. So I, uh, uh, together, we came up with this idea, I actually think it was his idea, um, of creating an advanced student tier. Uh, it's, it's $20 um, and there are weekly office hours. So uh, right now, the first office hour session will be next Tuesday at, I believe, I forget what time I wrote it down. I think it's 1.30 CT and then it's like, gosh, it's kind of early other places, but that's that's the time people chose. Um, if more people sign up for it, I will also create other time slots. So the goal behind those office hours is to have small group meetings. So say uh, no more than 10 people. Um, that way everybody can be unmuted the whole time and just kind of speak freely and ask questions and, and get feedback. So it's, it's just more uh, direct access and a sort of a smaller group uh, what do you call those things in university classes? I forget what those things are called. Where you have those uh, group session or something. A lot, of, a lot of big lectures in universities have this thing. Um, seminars, are they called? I think of seminars as being those things where grad students sit around and pretend to have done the reading. Discussion section, that's it, discussion section. Thank you. Um, all of these answers are, are also correct, I think. Breakout sessions, uh, recitation section, those are all good. Yeah, so it's basically that thing. Um, so the, these are small group sessions where everybody can come and, and participate and ask me direct questions, um, you know, and, and um, kind of get that small group um, sort of environment where uh, if you ask a question, 
if you want to ask a really tough question and I don't know, I have to admit to not knowing the answer and then we have to try to figure it out. So that's always quite fun. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that's on the Patreon page, which you have links to. I, I put them pretty much everywhere because, <laughs> you know, that's how it's got to be. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't think I'm going to open this actually because it will open my uh, page with, you know, direct uh, uh, messaging back and forth with patrons and things. And I don't want to display that publicly, but you can, you can use this link to go to the Patreon page and, and read more about that. Okay, and keyboards. Um, I believe there was a question about keyboards. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the, the time and date. Uh, okay. So 1.30 here, that's like super early uh, and on the West Coast. But it's, it's also manageable um, in, in East Asia. So that's, that's probably good. I mean, the nice thing about being in Central European time is that depending on the time of day, I can basically cover uh, just about anywhere in the world. So we might have two group sessions, one of which covers, um, you know, Asia, Europe, and maybe just barely the East Coast of the United States, and maybe a, a, a later session that uh, is at a reasonable time on the West Coast. So yeah, we can discuss that further. Uh, if that's something you're interested in, um, go check it out on Patreon. I've had quite a few questions about the keyboards. Uh, there, there's instructions here that I put on my website a long time ago. Uh, these instructions are for uh, OS 10. So um, I don't mean for it to be exclusive uh, to, to people who use Mac computers or anything, uh, but those are the easiest keyboards to make. That's kind of like a weird, uh, weird consequence of this. Let me go to the website and see if I can find, I think I, think I do have a link to, yeah, to the to the hieroglyphic keyboard on PC. Um, that is put out by uh, this uh, third party software company. I believe there's a free version and I think the keyboard should be free too because I wrote it and gave it to them. So uh, if it's not free, please tell me and I will uh, send an email right away. It should be free because I, I wrote it and gave it to them for free and I don't get any kind of royalties from that. So yeah, should be free. Um, that works fairly well, as I remember. Uh, I haven't used it in quite a while, to be honest, but I believe it works well. It is free. Uh, it comes up right away when you Google it. Look at that. Well positioned. Awesome. Maybe I should ask for royalties. Um, I don't know about other operating systems, like if you use any uh, any version of Linux. I, I couldn't tell you about that. I know that one of our students uses Linux and can probably speak to that if anyone has any questions. Uh, he's, he's also on Discord. Um, what, what, there's one more thing I was going to say about the keyboards. Oh, fonts. So uh, in order to use, is there a fonts section on here? Hmm, maybe I should amend this. I'm going to say keyboards and fonts. And um, I'm actually going to add this. What heading is this? Heading two keyboards. I'm going to add a font section to this and provide links to um, various uh, free hieroglyphic fonts. Uh, basically, if you're seeing um, like little Unicode um, unknown character rectangles where the hieroglyphs are supposed to be, for instance, here, uh, if you see just three rectangles there instead of the proper hieroglyphs, it's probably because you don't have the proper fonts installed on your system. And I'll, I'll go back in here and put links to different fonts that you can download. Uh, these dictionaries are all, I believe, in PDF form. Oh, there's even a Google Sheets, which you can tinker around with. Um, these books um, these books are relatively easy to find online. Um, if you already know how to find books online, then you'll know where to look. Uh, I, I didn't put links to them because I'm just not sure. I'm not sure if that still falls under fair use if I'm just putting whole books online. And we're also not specifically using anything from these books. They are my sources that I'm using to write the textbook that we're using for this class, which is being written as we go. Oh, sure. OK, good question here in the chat. Since the syllabus is editable by everyone, should we just add a page where everybody can organize the good ones they found, keyboards for different OSs? Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, actually, I'll say, um, 
it's actually not editable by everyone. I don't think, uh, or maybe it is. So it, it's, um, what is it? It's suggesting everyone, everyone has suggesting privileges. So yeah, you can go ahead and put suggestions in there and, and I'll approve them um, provided that they're not uh, erroneous. There have been a lot of um, erroneous edits to this, which I assume is just sort of like uh, Google Docs glitches or accidental keystrokes as you're reading the documents. So I just reject those. Uh, please don't feel rejected if I reject your edits. It's probably because I just assumed that they were accidental. And yeah, so that's basically the overview of the course. Everything that you need should be in the syllabus page or, um, or on Discord. So those are the two main sources to keep up with information on the course. And then of, of course, all the, um, all the videos will be on YouTube. And I'll put a link to uh, the YouTube playlist in at the top of this syllabus. Okay, so um, that's, that's quite a lot about that. Um, and we'll just, from there, we'll just jump straight in. Unless there are uh, specific questions about some of the things I just said, I don't see any hands raised. So I think we're good. Okay, so this introduction, uh, all of these, all of the copy in this book um, is for you to read on your own. I'll, I'll talk about these things in the way that I always speak in a, in a classroom setting, which is um, sort of extemporaneous. Uh, so I'll talk about the same things, but maybe not in exactly the same way. And you're encouraged to also read this. None of it should be terribly long. Okay, so the first thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about ancient Egyptian is that the knowledge of the script was totally lost. So the um, the last hieroglyphic inscription is on the Temple of Philae. It's called the inscription of like Esmet Ahom or something like that. Esmet Ahom, look at me. Wow, I might actually know some of this. Um, so this is the last hieroglyphic inscription. It was written sometime in the fifth century, I believe. Oh, late, late fourth century, close enough. Um, so after this point, hieroglyphs really as far as we know, we're not in active use. And even this inscription is, it's, it's really pretty bizarre as Egyptian goes. Um, it has a lot of weirdness in it. Kind of uh, towards the end, uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphic script became, um, it became associated with esoteric priestly knowledge. So uh, throughout Egypt's at the beginning of the Christian era, there were temples that were still preserving knowledge of the ancient religion and the ancient script, but they had kind of retreated into themselves. They had become really one of the one of the earliest ivory tower sort of settings where um, the people in these contexts were really only talking to each other and they weren't using this script to communicate outward. So it started becoming um, very obtuse and they started you know, the number of hieroglyphic signs just exploded because they would make lots of little variations and produce lots of uh, kind of visual word plays and things. So that's the last hieroglyphic inscription, Asmeta Home in 394, uh, but hieroglyphs had been on, a, on their way out for, for a long time when that inscription was written. So what happened after that is that the Egyptian language continued to be spoken uh, it was spoken in the form of Coptic, which was generally written with a, a slightly modified version of the Greek alphabet. And it was the, the spoken language of Egypt, even at least up to the 10th century CE. And there are scattered reports of uh, villages where people still natively communicated in Coptic in the 18th century. So the Egyptian language probably continued to be spoken uh, right up until the modern era, uh, but the hieroglyphic script wasn't written anymore. So that's the main thing that I'm talking about when I say that it was lost. Um, I just recently submitted a paper where I argued that um, the study of Egyptian phonology has for far too long ignored the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We've ignored uh, the entirely valid historical phonetic information that is preserved in the liturgy of the uh, Egyptian Coptic church, uh, where, where it's still used today. Coptic is still used as a liturgical language of the church. And there's, I think, very good evidence that that liturgical language actually preserves a lot of features of older stages of Coptic uh, that can be reconciled with 
the the information that we've gleaned from like historical linguistic approaches. And I, I think that's been ignored for, for way too long in Egyptology. So I don't want to say that the language itself was lost. I think it, it was never lost. I think it still hasn't been completely lost, but the script was certainly lost and really no one knew how to read it. Um, there's a recent, there's been a recent argument by uh, Dr. Oshaka. Aurelio, what's his first name? I'm blanking on his first name. Dr. Oshaka, he's an Egyptian Egyptologist who has argued that there's evidence in Arabic texts from the medieval period uh, that show, oh, I forgot to fill this. Is that Aurelio? Let's see what he's got. Adali Oshaka. Um, you can unmute if you need to. Uh, anybody can unmute if you need to, if you want to just like, you know, you should probably have a, a decent reason for doing it, uh, not just to like shout abuse at me or something, but yeah, if you want to unmute and say something, be my guest. So um, this Egyptologist has argued that there's evidence in the Arabic manuscript tradition that Islamic scholars knew something about hieroglyphs. Uh, his argument, uh, as best as I understand it, obviously I don't wanna mischaracterize his argument, but as I understand it, he argues that Arabic scholars uh, knew or, or suspected that some hieroglyphs were phonetic. The host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves? I didn't mean to do that. Uh, oh, allow participants to unmute themselves. Sorry about that. Yeah, if you need to unmute for whatever reason and, and pipe up, go right ahead. Um, so his argument, as I understand it, is that uh, some, some scholars during the Islamic period writing in Arabic understood that some hieroglyphs are phonetic, although they didn't always get the values right. It seems that they got almost none of the values right from what I can tell. And uh, it, it seems to be the case, at least from as much as I've looked at it, it, it seems to be that you would be, you would be likely to get the same number of things correct if you were to, to guess at random. So I don't really think they knew how to read Egyptian, but it is entirely possible that, um, that later scholars sort of grasped that the script is not purely pictographic, but is also phonetic. And that was one of the big realizations that totally changed our understanding uh, today. So um, an, an English uh, polymath, I guess you would say, uh, Thomas Young, uh, can, uh, hypothesized that the names on the Rosetta Stone that the cartouches on the Rosetta Stone represent names, and that because they represent Greek names, the hieroglyphs used in those cartouches must have phonetic values. Because while you can you can represent um, most concepts pictographically, and you can even use um, some scripts like bliss symbols that represent uh, just about anything you can say pictographically, you can't represent foreign names pictographically because there is no image associated with them. They're just sequences of sounds. So if an Egyptian text contains foreign names, it's reasonable to conclude that some of those hieroglyphs are phonetic. Uh, and that was a really important realization. We don't know for sure whether Champollion had seen Thomas Young's uh, paper on this subject. Oh, sorry, interesting side, side note. Uh, Thomas Young was also the person who developed the, the famous double slit experiment that shows the wave character of light. So he was a pretty, pretty interesting guy. Uh, he's been called the last man who knew everything. That's, uh, you know, quite a title. Um, so after Thomas Young and perhaps um, basing some of his hypotheses on, on Thomas, Thomas Young's deductions, um, Jean-Francois Champollion, um, reasoned that some hieroglyphs are phonetic. He derived their values from cartouches using the Greek names. And then he used his knowledge of the Coptic language, which again is just the Egyptian language spoken at a slightly later date uh, to fill in the words that he didn't know. So he was able to kind of take some of the sign values, um, match them up with Coptic words that he would expect based on the Greek text and then um, you know, figure out the, the missing values uh, th through, a, through a process much like doing a crossword puzzle. You know, if you have a crossword puzzle and you have 
um, one of the clues isn't figured out, but you've got three of the letters and you know how long the word is, you can normally figure out what the missing letters are. That's basically what Champollion did with the phonetic values and his knowledge of Coptic. Uh, before then, people believed, many people believed, maybe not everyone, but many people believed that hieroglyphs were purely pictographic. So uh, there's a famous text called the Hieroglyphica that sur survives from, we're not exactly sure when, but from the medieval period in Greek, um, where an Egyptian author, it's believed to be translated from an Egyptian text, an Egyptian author explains the meanings of hieroglyphs, 1400s, thank you. Um, I thought we weren't sure about the date though. I feel like we're not sure on that 1400s date. I guess uh, like Greek, people who are good at Greek paleography might be able to give us something pretty precise that we wouldn't be able to, at least I wouldn't be able to check because I don't know Greek paleography. But anyway, sometime during the medieval period, uh, a text was discovered that explains or, or claims to explain the meanings of hieroglyphs in Greek. And uh, there's, there's quite a lot in there. It's really interesting. You can easily find it online. Uh, it's called the Hieroglyphica of Heropolo. And uh, he says delightful things such as uh, he claims that the glyph, this one, which is a viper, represented the concept of eternity because some snakes are immortal. That's a really interesting concept because there's, um, there, there's, there's kind of a widespread idea in the ancient Mediterranean that some snakes are immortal. There's a famous scene uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh where I think Gilgamesh finds this plant that grants eternal life, but then he loses it because a snake sneaks in and steals it. And that's why that snake is immortal. So there's kind of a, a common folk belief that a certain species of snake, snake was immortal. So Heropolo kind of brings all these things together in a sort of abstract way. And he says, well, this hieroglyph represents the concept of eternity because the snake is immortal. Um, obviously, as far as we know, no snake is immortal. Oh, good question here. Isn't that a cobra? The viper is a different glyph. There's also a different cobra glyph. I, I don't know for sure, to be honest. Um, there's a different, uh, it's I-10, there's I-11, oops, I-12. Wait, where'd my Egyptian keyboard go? I-12, so that's the cobra glyph that I'm most familiar with that shows a, a king cobra with its neck flared. And that's normally associated with goddesses uh, because it's associated with um, Uto. The, uh, the snake goddess. Um, but I think that this is a viper because the Coptic word for viper is ajo. So it has the phonetic value that we would expect here. Uh, whereas the word for cobra, I don't remember the Coptic word for cobra. That's a shame. I really should. Um, but I don't think it has that phonetic value in it. That's why I think it's a viper. Anyway. Um, The word for cobra is yaret, like Uraeus. That, that makes sense. Um, good to know. Thank you, Solange. Uh, I'm really grateful to have a lot of um, really awesome Egyptologists who are also in this class who can fill in the things I don't know, because I definitely don't know everything. OK. So he claimed that this glyph represents the concept of eternity. Um, and he's kind of right. So there's this word jet. That is a very, very common Egyptian word. You can, if you go to any museum collection and that has um, um, Egyptian hieroglyphs engraved in stone anywhere, especially royal inscriptions, you will almost certainly see this word. It means eternity, um, to, to oversimplify a bit. And it has this, um, this snake in it very prominently. So that's probably where Heropolo is getting that from. He probably has some idea that this word means eternity, but he's explaining it in this very sort of symbolic abstract way. Like it, it represents that because these snakes are immortal. Uh, there's another example. I think he says that the, the, the za or sea glyph, which is a pintail duck, he says that it represents a sun uh, because these ducks are very loyal to their parents. I don't know if I'm remembering that exactly correctly, but he says something like that. Basically he comes up with all these elaborate explanations for why glyphs mean certain things, but the actual reason is that they just are phonetic. Um, just like letters of the English alphabet, they provide both phonetic and lexical information at the same time. So it's really quite complicated and um, it would be very difficult to figure out if you didn't already know that. 
And then in 1799, uh, French soldiers in the city of Rashid, which is on the Mediterranean coast of the Delta, um, while they were building fortifications because they were attempting to colonize Egypt, uh, they, they found this stone in a wall and the, the uh, French soldier who discovered it rightly recognized that it was probably something very valuable for the study of Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, they made prints directly from the stone itself. So they actually inked the surface of the stone and slapped big pieces of paper on it and then sent those to universities in Europe. And um, the Temple of African Community is Rosetta. Interesting. I don't actually know anything about the Temple of African Community. Um, please forgive me. But that's if anyone is interested in, in knowing more about that. Um, so, so the French found it. The, the English then, or the British, I suppose, at this time, uh, the British uh, captured it en route to France and took it for themselves. And it now sits in the British Museum, where, where in my opinion, it does not belong uh, because it was stolen from Egypt. Um, but it did help us decipher Egyptian. Um, in fact, we would, without having the actual physical stone itself with just the prints, we would have been able to decipher Egyptian because as you can see, it provides uh, three inscriptions. Uh, two of them are in Egyptian language and one of them is in ancient Greek. So the first is a hieroglyphic inscription. You can see that quite a lot of it is actually missing. It's just the lower roughly one third of the inscription. So by comparison, that would be you know something like this part of the Greek. Uh, why is it called the Rosetta Stone? Uh, the French called the city of Rashid uh, Rosetta. I think because it sounds roughly similar and they were kind of just turning the Arabic name into something that sounded more familiar. I believe that's the reason. I don't think it has anything to do with uh, roses or rosettes as far as I know. Uh, I think it's just a, a phonetic similarity that they went with. Um, the, the middle inscription is Demotic, which is a handwritten Egyptian script. Obviously, in this case, it's been inscribed, but it is generally an Egyptian script that is used for writing the Egyptian language in ink on papyrus. So you can imagine that when Egyptians needed to write a letter or um, uh, you know, create a, um, a deed for a property or um, an IOU or a marriage contract or any sort of everyday purpose, they didn't actually sit down and draw all the hieroglyphs on papyrus. They used simplified forms of them. Uh, the first simplified hieroglyphs, which we call hieratic, um, come from, oh, sorry, I'm an Egyptian keyboard, come from the site of Wadi El Jarf. Uh, the Wadi El Jarf papyri were discovered and published I think about a decade ago at this point. Uh, and they show the earliest examples of hieratic that we know and you can see from these papyri uh, that they look quite a bit like hand-drawn hieroglyphs. Some of them more so, these ones are quite detailed. And then some of them look a little less like hand-drawn hieroglyphs, but they're still pretty detailed. Uh, this is from the Old Kingdom. I believe it's from roughly 2400 BC. Uh, forgive me if my memory on that date is faulty. Uh, but it's from a very long time before the Rosetta Stone. So roughly 2000 years before the Rosetta Stone was carved. Uh, they, Egyptians, as far as we know, started producing uh, written texts with ink on papyrus and they started abbreviating the forms of the signs. Uh, that script continued to develop um, in the context of Egyptian writing and it, it kind of acquired an identity of its own. By the time we get to the demotic script, it really no longer looks anything like hieroglyphic. Um, I'll be quite impressed if you actually recognize any hieroglyphs in this because they're it's kind of just a bunch of abstract squiggles, um, which is the same thing that you see uh, with things like cuneiform, where the early cuneiform signs are actually quite obvious. It's it's clear what they're depicting, and then later on, they're they're they become more abstract over time. So, two Egyptian scripts: hieroglyphic and demotic, and ancient Greek. And that actually isn't a it isn't a perfect solution. These texts don't match perfectly. They say slightly different things, uh, but it provides enough points of alignment that we could actually start breaking up what some of the signs mean and then take those to other situations and determine whether we have a good idea of what things say. And that's exactly what happened. I think, uh, I think Champollion looked at an inscription from a royal sculpture of 
of a Tutmosid king in Turin and was able to decipher the name and recognize it as Tutmosis. Um, and that's how he determined that his decipherment was correct because he was able to read something um, totally new and, and unconnected to the Rosetta Stone. Was Demotic understood at the time of the discovery? Uh, no, but Demotic was deciphered actually before hieroglyphic Egyptian. Um, a Swedish scientist named Ackerblad, I don't actually know how to pronounce his name. I'm sorry, it's that A with the little circle on top. I don't know how you pronounce that sound. Um, but it's like Ackerblad. Ackerblad. Uh, yeah, him. I've never been able to find a picture of him, which is really unfortunate because um, it would be cool to throw his picture into you know where I write out the story, but I can't find one. Yeah, so he was the first decipherer of hieroglyphs, of, of demotic, sorry, and then other people followed. And it was actually deciphered before hieroglyphic, interestingly enough, even though uh, it's much more difficult. I've often said that demotic is far and away the most difficult script that human beings have ever devised. And, um, you know, I, I make that statement as a, in order to issue a challenge, I challenge you to find me a script that is, um, just more idiosyncratic and cumbersome than the demotic script. It's without question the most difficult script I've ever studied. Oh, A with a circle on top is pronounced like O in rock. Um, ocker, ocker blood, ocker blood. Okay, there we go. I'm learning things too. Okay, I didn't actually write up this story. Um, I'm gonna write it up in my own way, but the story has also been told in a million places. The Wikipedia page is quite good. Uh, so. In the meantime, uh, before I get around to it, what about Japanese kanji? Um, let's see. If if so, I don't know that much about Japanese, but I know there are two scripts. I believe they're called kanji and kana, and one of them is based on um, on Chinese, and one of them is phonetic. And um, I think that is, in a sense, sort of equally complicated as demotic. If there were only um, roughly 200 signs in the entire Japanese script, so both scripts combined. And if any sign could at any moment be either kanji or kana or um, any other kanji or kana sign at the same time. So it's not just, it's complicated in, in every possible way. So just about any demotic sign could represent um, 10 different totally unrelated things because a bunch of different hieratic um, ligatures merged into a single shape in demotic. So any any single sign in demotic can mean a bunch of different things, and it can be either phonetic or logographic. Um, and um, and most of the time, demotic signs don't actually mean anything at all on their own. You can only resolve them in context of neighboring signs. So it's um, it's just about. Yeah, please do. Please send me a video. Um, I'm, I'm definitely happy to have that statement challenged, but I have looked at all the other scripts that people say are really complicated and none of them really holds a candle to demotic because you, you never have this quality of um, the signs not meaning anything on their own 100% of the time and being able to, to represent a dozen different things at the same time. Um, and so you have this uh, you have this kind of exponential growth of um, possibilities. So if you look at a sequence of demotic signs, the first one can be a dozen different things. The second one can be a dozen different things. And the third one can be a dozen different things. But all three of those together can only be one thing. So you actually get this sort of thing where the, the number of possibilities explodes exponentially, but then the intersection of those three possibilities resolves itself to one single thing most of the time. It's, it's a really weird script to read. Um, but, but quite fun. Um, okay, and uh, hieroglyphs themselves are really quite challenging. So I put this in uh, right at the start because I don't want anyone to be dismayed simply by the challenge. Again, this is a very low pressure course. You're allowed to show up without doing your homework. You're allowed to not show up at all. Uh, the, the idea is that it shouldn't, it shouldn't overwhelm you, uh, but hieroglyphs are quite difficult. And I've tried to break that down into the three most difficult parts. Uh, so the first difficult part is learning the glyphs um, you will not be asked to sit down and memorize all of the hieroglyphs that the, the, the phrase all of the hieroglyphs isn't even really meaningful 
uh, because hieroglyphs are an open set. It, there, there are three theoretically an infinite number of hieroglyphs, but you won't even be expected to sit down and memorize all the common hieroglyphs. I'll ask you at the beginning to memorize a small set of phonetic hieroglyphs so that you have enough um, you have enough sort of handholds to, to get a grip on the wall and start climbing. Um, so we'll, we'll get those first few things anchored down and that does require some memorization or some practice. And then we'll move on to looking at things like words and grammar. Uh, so the second most difficult part and really uh, the most difficult part of learning any language is learning vocabulary. Uh, there are probably roughly a dozen words of ancient Egyptian that also exist in English. I can think of uh, the word gum, like chewing gum, is um, from an ancient Egyptian word for tree resin. Uh, oasis comes from wahi, which means an, an oasis or, or a dwelling place. Um, the English word adobe is my favorite. It comes because it comes from the ancient Egyptian word for brick, which is uh, doba or dobi. And then it uh, gets borrowed into Arabic, which then gets carried um, uh, by the Islamic expansion through North Africa into Spain, where it's then adopted into Spanish, where it's then carried by the Spanish through uh, the, the conquest of the New World into the Southern United States, where it's then borrowed into English. So if you've ever heard of an adobe house, that's actually an, an ancient Egyptian word, adobe, that means brick. Uh, desert actually doesn't come from ancient Egyptian. Desert comes from the Latin word desero uh, to, or deserere. Saturday, I don't know where the stress is, uh, which means to abandon. Um, and, and then this desertum is like the, the uh, passive participle, so something which has been abandoned. Uh, deshret in Egyptian is uh, just coincidentally similar in the Egyptological pronunciation. Uh, barge or bark, yes, that actually comes from probably from Phoenician, a Phoenician word uh, that was borrowed into Egyptian as ba'iri, which was then borrowed into Greek as ba'iris, and then borrowed into other European language languages where it became uh, the word barge, which was borrowed into English from French, I believe. Um, oh, Susan, that's a good one. Um, Shoshen means lotus in Egyptian. So the name Susan comes from the word for lotus. The name Phineas probably comes from uh, the Egyptian phrase, the Nubian used as a name, uh, and ebony and ivory. Yeah, like the song. Uh, ebony also comes from Egyptian hovni, and um, an ivory from, what is it, ebur? Something like that. Uh, hut, hut, I think, I would say probably not, but I'm not totally sure. Hut theoretically could, but it's, I think hut is a is a Germanic word, so it seems unlikely. Most of the Egyptian words that show up in English go via some fairly indirect routes, like they get borrowed um, by by different European peoples and then carried into English in some way. Uh, hut is definitely Proto-Germanic because it's cognate with the German. Okay, so yeah, uh, the point of all of that, aside from the fact that it's really fun to find modern English words that come from ancient Egyptian is to say that there is almost no overlap whatsoever. Your lexicon of Egyptian probably contains between zero and a few hundred words. So if you're um, really into Egyptology and you read a lot of Egyptology books, you'll probably see, you'll probably have seen a few ancient Egyptian words that we can't really translate like ka or ma'at, um, isfet, the names of deities, those kinds of things are Egyptian words that you might know, but it's a, it's a handful at best. Really, you have to pretty much learn entirely new words, and that involves studying a lot of vocabulary. Uh, fortunately, the vocabulary is all in the textbook, and that's what we will be using to read. So you'll, you'll have a good start uh, with a kind of like a, a subset of the full lexicon to develop a foundation with that you can then take and use um, to read Egyptian texts. And then syntax, um, I think this is probably the most exciting part of studying an ancient language is, is seeing how the grammar actually works. And that's something that we'll learn um, after we get a bit of a foundation with um, reading some hieroglyphs and, and reading some words, uh, we'll then start talking about how those words combine to make meaningful utterances. So um, that leads us to chapter one, uniliterals. 
um, and our first attempt to decipher some ancient Egyptian. Okay, so I created an exercise here. I actually created this a few years ago for a summer class that I taught. And I think it's quite fun. It's also published in a book. I forgot what the book is called. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna plug my wife's book. Give me just a second. Hey lady, what's your teaching book called? Uh, an Educator's Handbook for An Educator's Handbook for Teaching About the Ancient World. Okay, I had to ask the wife. She put together this book and, and she even published something by me. An Educator's Handbook for Teaching About the Ancient World. Look at that, it even comes up in Google searches. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my wife edited this book and has a bunch of different resources in it. Uh, if you teach about the ancient world, there's probably some interesting things in there. You can also download the PDF for free, I think. Um, so you can check it out that way. But the print book is, uh, I think it's printed in A5 size. So you can, um, you, you can photocopy it at 200% and produce handouts. It has a bunch of handouts in it. So that's pretty neat. Um, she doesn't get any royalties, by the way. So just buy it if you need it. <laughs> um, all right, shameless plug, over. All right, so I created this exercise and it's in that book and it's also here. Purpose of this exercise, uh, as with so many of these exercises, is to encourage you to, um, as they say in math textbooks, convince yourself of the truth of this theorem. So basically I'm going to claim that these Egyptian hieroglyphs have, um, represent single phonetic values. And um, I want you to sort of prove that to yourself uh, by working through these examples. So you're given a, a short list of different uniliteral hieroglyphs. And your goal is to use these uh, foreign names that were written in Egyptian to figure out what these different signs mean. You will almost certainly get some of them wrong as Champollion did as well, um, because there's, some, there's a few red herrings in here, but you'll get most of them. And then I'll tell you what all the real values are. So this is the part where we see how calling people in a Zoom room with a massive number of people in it actually works. Um, so I will call on you by asking you to unmute, I suppose, and maybe just give you a, a second or two uh, to decide whether you want to give your answers. Someone, someone disappeared. Oh my gosh, people are bouncing around. Okay, so let's see how this works. Or you can raise your hand if anybody would like. I should have started asking for volunteers. If anybody would like to answer, um, raise your hand. Temple African Community of Chicago, would you like to answer some of these? If you're if you're speaking right now, I can't hear you. I'm getting um. Uh, oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Uh, you're you're cutting in and out. It's a little fuzzy. I I can't really hear you. I'm I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. I'll, I'll ask for another volunteer, but we'll, we'll try it next time. Where are we starting? At the top? Oh, you're, you're back. Okay. Um, yeah, let's just start at the first one. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is that better? It is better. Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can, yes. Okay. Yeah, you sound great now, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so where are we starting? We're starting with the first cartouche or um, the symbols? Yeah. That um, let's start with the first, let's start with this symbol. That is an okay, Egyptian turkey uh, vulture. Okay, and I believe that uh, has the ah sound. All right, so like an A or an A ah type That's, sound. Yeah. Okay. What about the second one? Uh, the second one is, I believe, a reed leaf. It is. And the reed leaf has the E sound. That's right. 
kind of an E. It could be like an E as in the English word, like bean, um, or, a, or a sort of I or a Y sound. So yeah, E basically. And then there's the double reed leaf. That's right. Um, and I believe that also has the E sound, but like um, represented by a Y sometimes. It's normally represented by a Y. It, um, yeah. it normally has more of a, of a Y quality to it. Um, you wouldn't be able to, to detect that from this, from, from this worksheet though. But yeah, they, basically you should, it's reasonable to get the same answer in here. Uh, but then we'll talk more about what's different about them later. Um, that is a quail chick. It is. And it usually has the ooh sound. That's right. The, right. Um, the next one is like a coil, and it usually um, has the same ooh sound. That's right. Yeah, these, these two signs are generally interchangeable through, throughout Egyptian hieroglyphs. The next one is a noose. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was used as the O. That's right. It's the O in, in Cleopatra, I believe. I don't want to scroll because I'll lose my annotations. But yeah, I think below it's used as the O. Um, and the next one that looks like a square, I think, is um, mat, and that has the P sound. It may be a mat. I've always learned it as a footstool, like a wicker footstool. Um, but I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute it because I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it has a P sound, and you can see it here in Somtech, where where the P is quite clearly there. And we have the owl, mm -hmm. which has the M, represents uh, M, M. Yeah. And okay. the other one uh, is, it uh, looks like a platform. Nobody and knows for sure what that, that is. I, th I think it's a set of tongs, like a, like a Smith's tongs. That's my own hypothesis. Mm. So, oh. yeah. Uh, but that, I believe, also has the M sound. It's, it's like the quail chick and the, or it, it's interchangeable. Exactly. Yep. And then we have the wave, which represents water, and that has the N sound. That's right. And you can see it here in, in Alexandros. Um, the next one is, I guess, uh, the open mouth, mm -hmm. and that has the R sound. That's right. And we have, let's see, I think we have a few examples in here. There's one in Duryush and, um, and one in Alexandros. And then we have the lion, which represents L. That's right, yeah. Uh, that's something that developed later on. The lion started being used really reliably for the sound of L, um, L is, as in Alexandros. Uh, Egyptian, earlier Egyptian doesn't have a distinction between R and L. So you can think of it kind of like uh, Japanese. Those R and L are two different allophones of a single phoneme. Um, and it's quite likely that if you heard a native ancient Egyptian speaker speaking English, they would also um, struggle with distinguishing R and L in the same way that uh, some speakers of Japanese, for example, do when, when they speak English. Because uh, the, the language didn't distinguish, but then with the contact of Greek, that L started to become reliably distinguished in Egyptian. And then it's, it uses the lion to write it. Okay, um, the next one is like a bolted door. It's a door bolt. It's a uh, like a dowel with two rope knots on it that you would use to slide back and forth to lock or unlock a door. And that usually has the 
Z sound. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to say S. Um, S, S, it doesn't, or Z, or S or Z sound. That's right. Or yeah. depending on where it is. Yeah. The next one is about a clock. And that is the S sound. Okay. Yeah, I don't see one here, but yeah, that's that's definitely what it is. Um, the next one is, I believe, a pond. It is. Uh, it's a. Um, it's a shade. A pool. So, uh, we really English doesn't have an exact translation for this word, but we can translate it pool or cistern. Um, or even in some cases, maybe well. It's a it's a water storage device. So it has the sh, sh sound. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and write it the Egyptological way. So you can write this with the with the long s in IPA, or with the s with a with a hot check on top. Um, that's the Egyptol Egyptological convention. And the next one, uh, I can't remember what that represents, but it has the Q sound. I think it's a hill. It does have okay. the, it's generally the Q. Um, uh, Egyptologists are divided over what the exact value of the sign is, but I'll, I'll transcribe it as a Q. And the next one is a basket. And that represents the K sound. Yeah, uh, great. So in other cases where I've used this exercise, I've, I've encountered some confusion about this because you often see it, um, oops, you'll see it in cases like this where it's used as the, as the X in Alexander. Uh, yeah, it is just a K sound. In this case, X is represented by K plus S. Mm -hmm. And the next one is this uh, stand, mm -hmm. jar stand. And that one, I um, believe, is um, G for hey. the G sound. Yeah, here we have it in, uh, in this word where it, it's just used to represent a K sound because that distinction has been lost uh, by the time the Rosetta Stone was written. But originally, it is probably a voiced velar consonant. So, like, ga, essentially, like a g. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I believe it's called, it's, it's a stand for a jar. That's and right. It's, it's a stand for an amphora type jar. So, um, amphorae were, uh, were specifically shaped. I'm sorry, all the annotations are still there, but I don't really want to delete them. Um, amphorae <laughs> are, are, are typically shaped with this. Uh, pointed bottom because they, in, in order to be shipped, they were stacked inside of each other. And the pointed bottom allowed um, the next row of amphorae to stack in the, uh, in the vacancies left among the necks of the one beneath it. But then if you actually take one into a building to, to use the contents, you can't stand it up or it will fall over. So you need like a ceramic device um, that will allow it to stand up. And we, we have uh, quite a few examples from the ancient world. Uh, but the one de depicted in hieroglyphs is probably a ceramic jar stand, which serves an equivalent function to this metal one. It just holds it up so it doesn't tip over. Mm -hmm. Okay, where are we? Good, all right. Didn't move all my annotations somehow. Next one is the loaf, like a bread, and that has the T sound. Right, and we can see uh, I don't see an example right away, but um, to the question in the chat, we will read through um, each of these to, to see how they all work. I think the next one is a tethering rope. It's a hobble. So uh, if you are if you're traveling with horses and you don't have um, a way to enclose them overnight, you can put a short length of rope between their legs and that will allow them to walk, but it won't allow them to, to run or to canter. So they can't get very far. Um, it's called a hobble. I think that's what this and is. And that has um, like the TCH sound, like 
Like Like Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. We normally write it like this, a T with a with a single line underneath it. Um, and that's just a, an Egyptological convention again. Mm -hmm. It's here and here. In these examples, it's just being used to represent a T or a D sound. So it's kind of being used a little, a little imprecisely. And the next one is the hand. Mm -hmm. And that the D sound. That's right. So we have one here in Alexandros. Quite easy to transcribe in Polish. Um, interesting. Unfortunately, I don't know Polish, uh, but I imagine that's true. There's there's some interesting overlaps between Egyptian phonology and, and some other languages. That unfortunately, I don't really know enough about, but I, I see all the examples in uh, books and papers about Egyptian phonology. Uh, people who know Polish will pull examples like that to, to compare to. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Temple African community. Um, you did great. Uh, yeah, 100%. And by the way, my name, was, my name is Rosetta. Rosetta, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rosetta. Okay. Okay. All right. So very quickly, I will just, uh, I'll transcribe the Egyptian name and, and just read it aloud as we would in the Egyptological pronunciation. So here we have a P, uh, an S type thing, the S or Z character. Uh, very often this will be transcribed Z, although the distinction is not really at all meaningful at the time period that we're working. Um, originally in Old Egyptian, it was probably an interdental um, fricative. Interdental? Yeah, interdental fricative, like th like in the English word thin. Um, but then it, it merged with the S sound and they end up being uh, interchangeable. So we have P, S, a very badly written S, it looks like just a squiggle. Okay, P, S, and then M, and then second T, and then K. I didn't know which direction to read these. Well, I, I actually, I don't think I told you, and that was a little bit on purpose. So um, you can actually solve this without knowing which direction to read in, as long as you assume that they're written in a consistent uh, direction. It, it can be solved, it's just a little tricky. And I, I kind of let it be a little tricky on purpose uh, because the, the task of struggling often makes for more reliable memories. Um, yeah, in general, you look at something like an animal figure and you read toward the face. So you read opposite the direction the animal is looking. So in this first example, uh, we read um, toward the owl's face. So PSM uh, second TK. And then all, all the rest of the examples are actually facing the same way because I, I didn't want to make it too complicated. In a previous example, the, some of the cartouches were actually flipped back and forth um, just to make it you know, extra difficult. Uh, but in this case, I, I faced them all the same way to try to make it a little bit easier. So once you figure out one, you can, you can kind of figure out the rest. Uh, cartouches are written pretty reliably. Um, if it's written like this, you read this way. So you kind of read from the round end toward the flat end. And if it's written like this, uh, you read this way. So Egyptian can be read either left to right or right to left. It just depends on which way the glyphs are facing. And um, what that means is you can take any Egyptian inscription and just exactly mirror it like you would in a, you know, Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator or something. You can just flip it horizontally and still have a legible text. It will just now be read in the opposite direction. I'll show a quick example of that. My favorite example to use is the Pyramidion of Amenemhat III, which is in the, uh, it was in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Um, oh, not the pyramid, the Pyramidion. Um, I'm sure it's going to the, to the Grand Egyptian Museum or, or is already there. Uh, but in this example, as you can see, the, uh, the hieroglyphic inscriptions actually go in both directions. It's clear. So you can either read this way to read this inscription, or you can read this way to read this inscription. And you can tell by the way the signs are facing, which direction you should read. And it creates this really nice symmetry where you, know, you have the symmetric image and then the hieroglyphs kind of balance one another by going in two different directions. Um, just in case you're curious, these are two different um, king's names. So this is uh, Sire, the son of the sun, Amenemhat, given life eternally. and um, and then 
king of Upper and Lower Egypt. Uh, what is his name? Nimuria Nim Nimaatre, um, Dionkjet, uh, given life eternally. So there's, uh, I mentioned before this word jet, uh, there it is on a real inscription. Yeah, it's quite common. The point of that is to say that you can read in either direction and it just depends on which way the signs are facing. After a little bit of practice, um, you will have no trouble knowing which direction to read in. It will become really intuitive. And in fact, you will forever after have trouble with glass doors that have the word pull written on one side of them because you will never know which side of the door you are on because your brain will automatically flip every piece of text you read uh, without you noticing it. So that's, that's an extra bonus feature of learning ancient Egyptian. So you can't tell which direction English text is in anymore. Uh, so yeah, so all these are read this way, left to right. And this one, as I said, is P S M second T K. So the Egyptological pronunciation would be something like, I don't know, uh, Pesmechek, Pesmechek. Um, and it's, we know that it's the name um, Somtek or Sametikos uh, in Greek. So yeah, that's, that's what those values are. Notice there are, there are no vowels in this name whatsoever. And in fact, there are no vowels in any of these names. So this sign that we gave the value of a ah to, which is entirely valid given the, the, the evidence you're given, it turns out that that actually represents something like the glottal stop. So the IPA sign that looks like this, it's the sound in the English word, uh-oh. Uh, it's the sound that goes right here, uh-oh. And uh, it's represented in uh, Egyptological transcription by this little three looking sign. Um, so yeah, we call it the Aleph bird. Uh, okay, so going on to the next example, and I'll, I'll run through these kind of quickly because we're already past the, the hour that I had planned, but I rambled a lot about the structure of the course, so that's my fault. Okay, so we have second T, R, double reed leaf. Uh, this is actually consonantal W, but it can have a vocalic quality, so it can be W or U sound, and then the esh sound. So something like Teriush, Cheriush, sorry, Cheriush with the second T would be the Egyptological pronunciation. And we know that that name in the original Old Persian was Duryush, or, or I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but something like that. Uh, so it, it matches quite nicely. And then the next one we have Aleph, L, K, S. Uh, this single reed leaf, which is written with this I with a little backwards facing cup above it, um, N, D, R, and S. So Alexandres, Alexandres, pretty close to Alexandros, but again, no vowels. Similar thing here, we have Aleph, U, uh, D, U, G, R, D, R. So Aldu, Gerader, and it's the, the Latin word, autocrator, wait, sorry, Greek word, autocrator, which is like um, imperator, emperor, I think. And the next one we have K, double reed leaf, S, R, S. And here you get a really great example of what it means to write without vowels. So in the word uh, kaiseros, you have a diphthong right here. So you have an ah sound with a little e at the end of it or a ya sound. Why wouldn't there be a second bird symbol for the second sound in Alexander? That's a great question. So I assume you mean Alex. And so why is there a reed leaf right here instead of a bird? Um, I don't know for sure, but um, it's uh, the system is just kind of messy. They're writing foreign names in a script that's not designed for them. And uh, if you look up these names in hieroglyphs, you'll find a dozen different examples with slightly different spellings. These are just the ones that I happen to have chosen for the activity because they illustrate a large um, subset of the uniliteral hieroglyphs. So it's a, a good way to get you started. Uh, yeah, great question. The Egyptian language does have vowels. Um, before Coptic, we don't really know what they are because they aren't written. Uh, we can kind of reconstruct them. In this course, we will be 
uh, looking at the Coptic descendants of the late Egyptian words that we learned so that you will kind of develop an intuition for uh, what the vowels would have sounded like. But we don't actually know for sure, so I'm not going to be teaching you the reconstruction. And that's something that we'll talk about probably next week when we get to uh, looking at Coptic and, and some example vocabulary. Okay, so going back to Kaisaros, there's this I sound in here, which is kind of like, it's often written phonetically like this or like this. Um, there's a little uh, kind of quiescent Y sound in that, in the, in the I diphthong. That's actually represented in hieroglyphs with this double reed leaf. So this name is actually a really good Egyptian spelling because it represents exactly the consonants and only the consonants. There's no A in here, there's no O in here, and there's no A in the diphthong in here. It's just the consonants. So, yeah. Okay, uh, in the name Cleopatra, we start with, uh, this is really the Q, um, so probably a uvular stop like P, uh, um, as, it, as, in the, uh, as in the Arabic letter, it looks like this. Um, but again, that's debated, debated. Some Egyptologists think it's an objective, so like, uh, but uh, I don't know. It's kind of wishful thinking because people really like those exotic type sounds. They want to find them in Egyptian. Uh, the evidence for it is, is not good, in my opinion. But anyway, so probably a uvular uh, sound, and then the L, and then the Aleph. This sign, um, which is generally wa, it's usually a biliteral. But in this case, it's, it represents the O, interestingly enough, P, D, R, Aleph, and a final T. P, D, R, Aleph, and T. A uh, few strange things in there. The, the presence of the O is a little weird, although at this time period, this is very late. Uh, that, that WA sign has really um, developed the ability to represent the O in Greek words, uh, and it's often used that way. The, the Q, uh, the, the uvular sound has merged with the velar sound. So pa and ka now sound exactly the same. Uh, so they're interchangeable. They probably chose this one for aesthetics. Maybe it looks nice above the lion or, or somebody thought that. Uh, I don't know for sure. Uh, so klao pedrat, something like that. Interestingly, there's a T on the end of this word. Um, does anyone want to try to guess why there's a T on the end of that word? You can raise your hand if you have a guess. Why would there be an erroneous T on the end of the word Cleopatra? Obviously the Greek word does not end in a T. Oh, we got two hands raised. Okay, uh, I, think, I think Pat, you're first. What do you think? Um, I assume for the feminine ending. Yeah, so the T is a very, um, it's the, the uniform uh, ending for feminine nouns. The feminine nouns in Egyptian usually end in a T, which is almost always not pronounced. It's kind of like the T in the American English pronunciation of the word cat, where you don't actually say cat, you just say cat and kind of um, you fail to release the T. That was the case in Egyptian for a very long time. So often this final T is written on feminine words, even though it's not actually pronounced aloud. Uh, and we, we see that happening here. And then finally, in the name Ptolemy, we have PT, uh, this WA biliteral, again, that's O, the L, um, the M, Y, and S, so double reed leaf and the bolted cloth. So Ptolemis, Ptolemis would be the Egyptological pronunciation. Again, in this, um, in this name, we have Ptolemaios. Uh, there's an A and an O that aren't written. We just have the Y all by itself between those two vowels. We have a question real quick. Uh, do you know why the lasso is used for the first O in Ptolemaios, but not the second one? Is it just aesthetic reasons or is there something more substantial going on? Um, is, the, is the first O in Ptolemaios an omega? And the second one, the second one is definitely an Omicron in Greek. Um, the first one might be an omega, so maybe they tended to use the wa um, to represent the long vowel, but not the short vowel. Uh, it's also the case that Coptic omits some short vowels, so it might have been just a um, just a convention. 
I'm trying to see another example. They also don't use it. They use the W here for this first O, uh, and that's definitely an Omicron. And they use they don't use anything at all for the second O, which I believe is an Omega. But someone correct me if I'm wrong. And we have a hand raised. Okay. Yeah. No. Just quick comment. There's a great website. I can post a link later where you can see multiple transcriptions of uh, Greek and Roman names, and often there's like half a dozen or more. And I think for, for Ptolemy, there's also a variant where you have the the other U. I mean, the, the little quail chick or even the vulture. So I think they just indicated, would be my thesis, um, enough to be able to pronounce it, but it's not really consistent. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It's, um, and this is often the case, if you, if you uh, spend time in, in any place that uses a different script um, than, the, than the Latin scripts that we use for English, um, you'll find some really interesting transcriptions. So the way I first learned to read the Arabic script was uh, walking around Morocco and looking at um, restaurants and things, which very often have the name of the restaurant in Arabic and then the same name in the Latin script. And uh, those are, it's, it's very imperfect, right? Because they're, they're made by different people at different times and, and people kind of make their own independent choices about how exactly to transcribe things. No transcription is really exactly perfect. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where you get a lot of variation in these things. And then the next section of this chapter gives you the quote unquote uh, real values. Uh, these are actually, I put it in scare quotes because these are actually the um, Egyptological values that we use as a matter of convention. And I've given you the Egyptological pronunciation as well, which is not phonetic. It's just a convention that we use because we need to talk about Egyptian words when we're um, you know, doing a class like this that's mostly in English. Uh, I wanna be able to, to point out a word like um, M or henna, this word here, henna. I might wanna refer to that word. Um, and the easiest way to do it is just to give you a sort of uh, bastardized pronunciation that's really just a scholarly convention. It has nothing to do or very little to do with the actual pronunciations of these words. And once you start getting examples of uh, Coptic relatives, which I think you'll actually see, let me see it's in the syllabus. I think it's in this exercise, which we'll, we'll um, start looking at probably next time or the time after, depending on how long it takes. You'll see that these things are really quite different. Um, oh, somebody put the answers in there. Please do not write the answers in the actual Google Docs. Um, please, please copy the document if you'd like to write the answers in your own version or everyone can see your answers, which is not a big deal, but um, you know, it kind of spoils the fun. Okay, so uh, in an, an example like this, uh, we would probably pronounce it something like op-ed, uh, but the Coptic word that we know is oft. So, you know, clearly not exactly the same, but some relationships there. We'll look more at that later. Um, from here, uh, you have a way to, to learn to produce the Egyptological pronunciation of some really common words that are written with uniliterals. You have some examples here. So for instance, um, I'll just go through them one at a time. M, N, R, or, or air, you can use an, an American English R if you like, uh, henna or henna if you wanna use the pharyngeal. Um, east to mentef or just entef, mentef, however you wanna say it, and jed. Uh, these are some really common Egyptian words that we'll refer to quite a lot. And that is the Egyptological pronunciation again, not the true pronunciation. And then you have a, a paragraph here on classifiers that I encourage you to read. Uh, this will help explain some other things that are going on on the script, in the script. Um, and then we'll look at some vocabulary examples next time and I'll read through them and then we'll um, look at the exercises. So there's a calligraphy practice, there's a Coptic. Actually, I think next time we'll probably go through the Coptic just for, for anyone who wants that. I labeled it supplement, but I wanna make sure we all go through it at least once. And then we'll look at the exercise where the Coptic can help you fill things in. So that's all for today. I'm sorry I went pretty substantially over time. I think I planned for between an hour and an hour and a half. So I hope it's not an imposition that we're at uh, 84 minutes here. Yeah, so uh, to wrap up, um, you have 
your next activities. I will update the syllabus after every single class with uh, both what we did and uh, what you should do next. And we'll just pick this up next Saturday, at same time, same place. Uh, if you're interested in the office hours, please go to Patreon and sign up for the advanced students tier, uh, because that's what's basically keeping this project in the black at this point. Uh, all the Zoom subscriptions and things were, yeah, not cheap. Okay, so I will see you all next time. Thank you so much for coming.